those who did not know this land before 1914 never knew it at all. Those who did not live before then ever saw this country at its greatest, its height, its imperial might, its wonderful security and its wonderful peace. The Edwardian age is often remembered with nostalgia as that leisurely time when the rich were not ashamed to live conspicuously and the sun never set on the British Empire. People are inclined to call the time golden, a golden afternoon, a golden age, and certainly to those doing well, there would never be a time quite like it again. On a lawn of brilliant green, he could see the sprinkled figures of his mother's guests, some sitting under the trees, some strolling about. He could hear their laughter and the tap of the croquet mallets. Round the garden spread the park. A herd of deer stood flicking their short tails in the shade of the beeches. For those with money, the period up to the First World War was undoubtedly one of ease, security and comfort. At the top of society, the landed elite, many of them old aristocratic families who may have been losing their grip on the reins of power but still retained fabulous wealth five or six large houses, enormous estates, 40 or 50 living in servants. Families like the Cavendishes entertained lavishly in London, and at weekends, Chatsworth, their country house, was filled with parties of visitors. The landed aristocrats were now joined by the new wealth of industry and commerce, who aped their lifestyle. Manderston in Berwickshire was built for Sir James Miller, the heir of the millionaire merchant. He demanded a house of glittering style to match his wealth and status as a country gentleman. Loriston Castle, Edinburgh, owned by the fine furniture maker, William Reed. Oh. 
With low taxation and the availability of cheap servants, those with money could enjoy a golden age. With all the trappings of wealth from steam yachts to motor cars, foreign travel and luxury hotels. There is no article of your food, there is no raw material of your trade, there is no necessity of your lives, no luxury of your existence, which cannot be produced somewhere or other in the British Empire. The British Empire was the largest and richest the world had ever known. It covered a fifth of the Earth's land surface and included a quarter of the world's population. The last 20 years of Queen Victoria's reign had been the Empire's hectic, heroic age, when battles were fought, frontiers pushed forward, and millions of colonial acres accumulated to the cheers of the crowd at home. Imperialists of that period had no doubts about the right of the British to rule. We happen to be the best people in the world, with the highest standards of decency and justice, liberty and peace. And the more of the world we inherit, the better it is for humanity. Others saw the empire as bringing economic benefits. The millions of people in the British colonies were a guaranteed market for the goods pouring out of Britain's factories. It also guaranteed a supply of cheap food and raw materials. Tea from India, rubber from Malaya, cotton from Egypt, cocoa from West Africa. The bonds grew stronger and tighter. Governing the empire also provided a huge number of jobs for men from the upper and middle classes. Many of them were good at what they did, but good for little else. This is how they had been educated, for the public schools were geared to the needs of the empire, not the economy. Nor did imperialists of this period mix much with local people. They, the rulers, were heaven-born, and the gulf was enormous. Unlike the colonists of other races, English settlers carry England with them. They keep their own language, marry their own people, hold on to their own lifestyle, and though they may live and die in the land of their adoption, look to the mother country as their home. The jewel in the imperial crown was India. Beginning with the East India Company's trading settlements in the 17th century, British influence had gradually extended over the whole subcontinent, until by 1914, one half of it was ruled directly from Westminster. In theory, India, like other colonial territories, was looked after for the benefit of its people until it was ready for independence. To most British colonials, this day was a very long way off. Unless Indians can govern India wisely and well, in accordance with modern national ideas, they have no more right to India than Hottentots have to the Cape or the uh, Blackfellas to Australia. In my opinion, Hindus would never govern Hindustan half or a quarter, or nay, one tenth as well as Englishmen.
Pride in Empire was reaching new heights at the end of the 19th century, but the bubble of enthusiasm was pricked by the Boer War. A small irregular army of Boer farmers inflicted defeats and humiliations on Britain. The war dragged on at immense cost. Even when it was won, Britain found herself with a giant empire to defend at ever a greater cost. Britain required a huge navy, big enough to beat any combination of powers. She was also committed to a giant naval race with her great rival, Germany. By 1910, certainly, Britain was beginning to feel that the empire was a liability as much as an asset. The strains and stresses were certainly beginning to tell. Even though the achievements of the empire were frequently drummed home, to a large proportion of the working classes, its glories and prestige meant little. Politically, the British Empire is a clumsy collection of strange accidents. It is a thing to be as little proud of as the uh, outline of a flint or the shape of a potato. For the mass of the English people, India and Egypt and all that side of our system mean less than nothing. Our trade is something they do not understand. Our imperial wealth, something they do not share. The working class made up three quarters of the population, though this covered a huge range of jobs and wage rates. For a skilled worker, extra wages meant just enough to gain a little higher social standing. We thought ourselves respectable working class. We were a bit above the labouring class who lived in the poorer districts of the town. Not that you'd look down on them in any shape or form. In fact, the only people you'd look down on was the people who used to drink and neglect their family. We were taught to make the best use of every apenny or penny that came into the house. My mother had it ingrained in her and we had it ingrained in us. This cottage was lived in by a pitman's family. His wages would have been high enough to feed and clothe the family properly and possibly even to save a little. The semi-skilled or unskilled workmen might aspire to respectability, but it was much more difficult to maintain on their income. The average wage of just over a pound a week might provide adequately for a single man or a newly married couple, but could cause serious hardship in families. They often found it impossible to maintain an adequate standard of food and clothing. The great bulk of this enormous mass of people are underfed, underhoused and insufficiently clothed. The children among them suffer more than the adults. Their growth is stunted, their mental powers are cramped and their health is undermined. Surveys showed that almost one third of the working classes were living in desperate poverty. Their low wages failing to keep pace with the rising cost of living. Their existence was made even more precarious by the constant threat of ill health and unemployment. For these people, there was no golden age. <laughs> 